Welcome to Forbidden Planet TV. I'm Andrew Sumner and today we've got a special edition of Forbidden Planet TV presenting the Titan Comics panel that I hosted for San Diego Comic Con at home 2021 a few weeks ago with our Titan Comics colleagues and the creative team from Titan Comics amazing Doctor Who comic books. So here they are all live from San Diego Comic Con at Home 2021. Big thanks to our pals at San Diego, Justin Duter and his amazing team. Enjoy. Welcome to San Diego Comic Con 2021 and welcome to the Titan Comics Doctor Who panel. I'm Andrew Sumner from Titan Comics and I'm privileged to be joined by the mighty creative team of our Doctor Who line. Author, writer, Jody Hauser, Artist, colorist supreme, Enrique Angelini. Editor supreme, Jake Devine. How is everybody? Great. Very good, very good thank you. How are you? Yeah. I'm, I'm very well, thanks, mate. Very well indeed. Looking forward to uh, talking about our Doctor Who line and principally uh, the, the uh, critical darling book that you guys have been getting a load of plaudits for, justifiably so, Doctor Who Missy. Uh, which go which which delves into um, the comic book life of one of the core recent Doctor Who characters who everybody's been crying out for to star in a book. Well, we we created that book. More specifically, we published that book. You guys created that book, and it is awesome. So, uh, Jody, what can you tell me about the concept of Doctor Who Missy? Well, we wanted to make it sort of a big event book, really, and really put Missy at the center of the book. I mean, she isn't just going to be a guest star in a Doctor Who book. She's just going to, you know, take over and be the center center figure in it. Uh, so we basically have her off on her own adventure and recruiting uh, her past self, the uh, Delgado Master, as her, you know, companion, uh, because, you know, she's not saying exactly who she is to her older self. <laughs> ah right okay yeah now now for, for anybody uh, Lawrence probably a note here saying for anybody who isn't a Doctor Who buff could you explain who Missy is I feel if you're watching this panel you probably are a Doctor Who buff but <laughs> uh, not that I'm disrespecting the question Lauren but I'm thinking the, 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 way, the way we the way to get into that would be could could Jake perhaps give us a pricey just of how Missy came to be and where she came from yeah so um Missy is basically the, or not the latest, but one of the most recent incarnations of the Master, who is one of the Doctor's oldest foes. Uh, also can be called a frenemy because sometimes they uh, they work together. Particularly Missy, they get along quite well for a bit uh, here and there. Um, so actually this year um, is the 50th anniversary of the Master's first appearance on Doctor Who, which is why we uh, Titan are celebrating that with this Missy story. Um, and Missy being one of our favourite uh, incarnations of the Master, um, and her not having her own comic story uh, in the uh, in the recent past, we thought, well, who else better to do? Yeah, and 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 it's it's worked out beautifully. If you're a Who fan and you're checking this panel out, and you haven't checked the book out yet, I, I guarantee you that you're in for a massive treat. And and so, um, what's it been like for you guys? putting the Missy series together? Well, oh, I mean, I I wrote a little bit of Missy back when I first started uh, working on the Doctor Who line because we did a book, Road to 13, that I wrote uh, backup stories for and uh, Enrica Colored and uh, Rachel Stott was the artist on those. And just doing four pages of Missy was so much fun. And the whole time I've been working on the book, I'm like, can we can we use Missy? Could we, you know, maybe just do some more Missy? I want to write more Missy. So uh, when Jake reached out and was like, so how about a Missy event? I I was very excited. Um, yeah, uh, she's just so so much fun to work on because she's just so madcap and unpredictable and. It's a lot of fun. Jodie, when you find yourself writing Missy, do you find yourself inhabiting the character to a degree? Um, I don't know if it's inhabiting so much as uh, when I write lines of dialogue, I want to make sure that as I read it back, I can hear, you know, if, if Michelle Gomez was saying it yeah. right behind me, which, oh, that would be actually really creepy now that I think about it. <laughs> yeah. but, um, really creepy yeah, in a always... brilliant way. <laughs> I always want to make sure it sounds like something that you would actually hear the actor 
uh, saying yeah. because when it's a character who we've seen on TV so much, we have a you know we do have a feel for how they talk and how they deliver lines and the sort of lines they would say. So I just want to make sure everything I write is consistent with that. And guys, I have to say that what you've collectively done. Uh, yourselves and the spectacular artist on this book as well, uh, Roberta and Granata, spectacular penciler. Um, you guys have uh, you've really channeled Michelle Gomez, I think. And I think that's what, when you read the book, you really get a sense of her performing the character as you read the book. And that's, that's no small feat, I think, guys. Yeah, I think a lot of that as well is to do, as you said, with... Um... Roberta's fantastic artwork. I mean, there's there's so many facial expressions that um, Michelle Gomez does in the series that Roberta's so easily able to capture. You know, she's so expressive um, in all the different emotions that she has. And a lot of it is, is I wouldn't say forced, but she puts it on so like spectacularly, like, like everything she does is a show, it's a performance. And I think Roberta just captures that so perfectly. No, I, I think that's true. I, and Enrique, given the fact that uh, there's this performative level um, to Missy as a character, what was it like creating the colours on this book? Well, we had a very, very good, very interesting description from Jody. Uh, I remember when I read the script for the first time, I thought, oh, this is, this is going to be fun. Because <laughs> as you might have seen, if you've read the books, if you haven't, go read the books. <laughs> but you might have seen online and articles and previews, she has a very particular outfit for this arc. And uh, we really wanted her to look the part. Oh. <laughs> For those of you who know what looking the part in this case means. And it was incredibly fun playing with this very doctor, but also very messy uh, outfit. I think it, it, especially after having worked so much on 13, it feels very familiar because it's kind of like that bright, fun uh, palette that, that we are kind of familiar with thanks to 13th wardrobe uh, but yeah we had lots of fun when I got the pencils from the Roberta I immediately put down some base colors and I sent them to Jody to verify that that was the uh, concept the idea the vibe that she was going for it, it, she was she was very happy so we, we had like a few very very happy exchanges like ah oh, this is gonna be so fun this looks so cool and yeah I, I think it's it's worked out great and uh, I think it has made for some really interesting aesthetics because we have some very like spooky atmospheres at times and like some stranded and some, uh, some stranded lands and deserts and lots of very different atmospheres. And then you have this bright pop color in the middle that it's just, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I think it was a very, for, for me at least, it was a, a fun treat to work on that. I'm excited to see if anyone cosplays this version of Missy. Like, uh, <laughs> yes. I was just thinking the same things happening again. Yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd love that. that. They will, and that will be that will be an amazing, amazing uh, thing to witness. I think that day when everybody's sat around, sat around the Titan booth signing, you know, and somebody comes up with with your version of, of the Missy app, that would be brilliant. That's the day I look forward to. So, guys, as we're talking about uh, Doctor Who Missy. Um, uh, as everybody will be watching this, we've just released uh, issue four, which is the uh, concluding issue, I think, right, Jake? Is that right? Yeah, that's right, issue four uh, of four and, of Missy. And so uh, everybody watching this, um, you'll be able to go and source all four issues from your local comic shop. And not only that, you will also be able to pre-order the uh, collected edition, which we'll be releasing in October this year. Now, now flipping back to your storyline, um, Missy has often been deployed previously as a kind of uh, supporting character who, who appears while the Doctor takes centre stage. And um, she, what, what, how have you been able, what freedoms have you had to deal with her that you wouldn't have been able to have had she just been the kind of villain of the art in a regular Doctor book? I mean, I think the big thing is we can make her plans a lot more ambiguous because she isn't obviously the villain but you know just because she's the main character doesn't mean she's a hero either so we sort of get to have her walk that gray line 
pretty much the whole story and leave a lot of her motivations a mystery until the end. So I think uh, because she is center stage and not an ancillary character who sort of has to fill a particular function in the story, she sort of gets to do whatever she wants, which, you know, knowing Missy is exactly how she'd like it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I yeah, do. I'd say something similar. Yeah, something similar. Um, you know, she she gets to just do what she wants. You know, so we don't get to see her interacting with the doctor or bouncing off the doctor and what the doctor's doing. We just get to see her on her own, and we get to see, oh, what does she do when she's on her own? And that that could be anything. Yeah, no, it's it, that, that's amazing. So, so Jenny, what, I, I, and Enrique, when you're getting into creating the character of, of, of Missy, whether you're, you're writing the character or whether you're creating that kind of lush um, vision scape. Um, do you have any techniques that you use to help you get into the right frame of mind? I'll generally go back and rewatch some episodes. Uh, and then while I'm working on it, I'll tend to go back and watch clips because I might not have time, you know, in the middle of the script to go sit down and watch an episode or two. But, you know, just always make sure I have that character and the, the way she acts and especially, you know, her sort of her movement and just her whole, the whole atmosphere around her, that that's always fresh in my mind. Yeah. Yeah, I do something quite similar. So if it's, especially if it's places that we've seen in the series that try and go back, uh, I like to go on Google and look for references or like browse my folders. I've been collecting <laughs> lots of pictures during the years <laughs> that we've worked together on the comic. And so, yeah, I try, especially if there is a specific place that is known to us, I try to make sure that I replicated time of lighting or atmospheres and if if not if we have never seen that special thanks to jakes they're always very helpful with this i i asked like how do we know anything from bbc about this place is there anything that we need to keep in mind because we want to make sure that people feel like they that they immediately recognize where the characters are and that, that it's just it's kind of a continuation of the experience that you have on screen, but on paper or still on screen if you're reading digital, of course. But like, yeah, you get that same feeling of uh, like the same uh, immersion that you would get while watching an episode, uh, but from our panel. So I, I just try and make sure that I match what we know is already out there. And if not, uh, try to make sure that whatever surrounds the characters helps bring out the feelings and the emotions and the action that is in the script. Yeah, lovely. Um, what can you guys tell me, um, now that we're free to discuss this a bit more than when we've done some previous conversations about this book, about who else is involved in this narrative from a doctor perspective and from a uh, villain perspective? Well, I mean, we we do see 12 and 3 quite a bit because those are the corresponding doctors yeah. to the masters. Um, but we do have uh, the third issue, which is sort of a, you know, trip through time and a little bit of a overview of um, most of the master doctor, you know, the, those sort of uh, relationships. So we just sort of get glimpses of fun moments. Like, and I even made sure to put in a reference to the movie with the eighth doctor, which was my intro to Doctor Who. So, oh, so because... Eric Roberts was your first master. Yep. <laughs> Brilliant. Absolutely. That is, and also that that's for me, he's the craziest, most out there, high camp master, as if they'd reimagined the master as a 66 Batman villain. You know, that's where you get <laughs> Eric Roberts, right? Um, I haven't thought yeah. about that, but yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think he's sorely underrated in many ways because his performance literally knows no limits in that movie. You know, it's like just when you think he's gone too far over the top, you realise he's nowhere even near the top. You know, there's <laughs> top still way up there in the stratosphere. But what a great, what a great one to be introduced to. When when you had that introduction, Jody, were you sat there going, "What on earth am I actually looking at?" Was that your first Doctor Who? It was my first Doctor Who. Um, I had friends in school who, uh, you know, watched watched the. Uh, episodes that were brought over on PBS over here. Uh, so I knew I knew a little bit about it. I knew he was an alien and he had different faces and he traveled around in a blue box. So I sort of had like the very, very basic stuff. Um, 
and I mean, I liked the movie enough that when the when the new series launched over here, I started watching from the beginning. So you know, something yeah. definitely stuck with me from that. Yeah, the power the power of that stuck with you. By the way, while we're talking about this, anybody watching this panel uh, should come and check out our YouTube channel, Forbidden Planet TV, where we've got a whole host of Doctor Who interviews with the team you see with me right here, and also a whole bunch of interviews with some of the original Doctor Who scriptwriters, including the guy who wrote the script for the, for the Doctor Who TV movie. And that is well worth 20 minutes of your time if you're a fan. It's very, very interesting, the whole story of that. Um, but to arc back to the to the to this creative team on this series of books, you guys have been together, working together yourselves, the three of you and Roberto, for quite some time now on Doctor Who. Jake, what's it like working with this creative team on these books? Uh, it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, I, I wouldn't want anyone else. These guys, like, they're hard workers. They get stuff done. They produce amazing work. Sometimes in really short amounts of time which <laughs> I always say, I'm really, really sorry. Can you get this done now, like today? But uh, they, that, yeah, that's the Titan they, way, isn't it, mate? That's, uh, that's yeah, imprinted yeah, on the have business cards. Yesterday? I'm really sorry. Could you get this done right now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, How long have you been on the book you... yourself for, Jake? Uh, so coming up to two years now, or just over two years. So I started on about issue nine or 10 of 13th Doctor. So yeah. So we, well, we were, Jody and I, we, we were just talking about your your tenure with the show. Um, for you, Enrica, how far? What was your first introduction to who? Uh, for me, it was a bit later. I was in uni, and I lots of my friends were big Doctor Who fans. There's a couple of them, especially that had like all the gadgets. They had Sonic, and they had probably more than one Sonic actually. And they had lots of very fun. Doctor Who themed scarves and hats and pins. So that's how I got to meet the doctors the first time. <laughs> and, and then from there, uh, lots of, uh, I started recognizing the characters on social media. So, like lots of clips and pictures. I was like, oh, this is the same thing that that other thing was, but this is a different actor, but it's the same thing. <laughs> and so, and, and then, uh, I got to know more about it. I knew that in uh, in the UK it was a huge thing, and in Italy, where I come from, it's not as big, but it was still. And I think the social media brought uh, uh, brought it more towards the Italian public, and then yeah, I was more and more exposed to it. And then when I when I f was invited to join the project, I binge watched uh, basically everything from the reboot on. So because I, we were starting with the uh, road to the 13th Doctor issue, so I had to work on uh, 10, 11 and 12. And so I wow. wanted to make sure I knew <laughs> what I was working on. So I think in the span of a month and a half, I binge watched most of it. <laughs> wow. So you had the, a brain expanding crash course. Yes. In, in the Hoover, because every short story in that uh, book that we did was a specific reference to one episode. And yeah. uh, I think yes. So every I I wanted to make sure that I watched, of course, the episode that corresponded to the story that we were doing to match the lighting and the atmospheres. But I can't I can't just watch the episode, <laughs> so it wouldn't it wouldn't have worked. I wouldn't have understood anything. <laughs> probably so I said yeah I'll just I kept what I had two screens that I was watching it I was I was working on other stuff so I I could have an idea of what I was working on so yeah and then after that of course I um I watched the 13th doctor show because uh that's what we were working on and, that, and that's kind of like home for yeah. me now when it comes to doctor who <laughs> Of course. Of course. Uh, for those for those first stories, was it easier that they were from like specific moments and specific episodes to have those color references? Yeah, I think that helped a lot because it was uh, um, it gave me an idea of what different vibes I could play with. So I remember uh, uh, for Tenant's story, there was like this very like this lots of greens and weird colors, and then there's lots of very bright blues. Well, with 12 and Missy, uh, we started with the outside with this, there's a like big space scene. It was so cool with lots of oranges and then we shift to a blue interior and that helped me a lot understand how much I could play with colors. Cause normally if I don't have a guide, I like if the script doesn't tell me that there's lots of vibrant colors, I try to keep it 
bit toned down because sometimes using very, very bright and very uh, vibrant colors can look weird if it's not the vibe that you're going for. So having the scenes from the TV series and seeing how the photography of the TV series itself was so colorful and bright and how the uh, like there's lots of secondary lights and lots of effects so that kind of told me yes you can you can play with this in this direction in that direction even if when it's dark and creepy it's still very vibrant it's still very colorful um so that was definitely helpful yes that's uh, that is so interesting mate and to 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 flip back to your personal histories how about yourself jake how, what was your what was your introduction to um, so I think I, I, I vaguely remember catching a glimpse of the Eighth Doctor movie when I was very young, um, but I was, had no clue what it, what was going on there, what, what it was about. Um, but I knew of Doctor Who because I knew my parents watched it when they were younger. So when the new um, reboot started, or not the reboot, but the, the new series started in 2005, um, they were like, come on, you've got to watch this, you've got to watch this classic. Um, and yeah, I was hooked from the first episode. So ninth Doctor, I would say, is my first Doctor, officially. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, I was hooked from then on. Yeah, no, I think the ninth Doctor series is great. The, the first Doctor was my first Doctor. Right? But I was very young when I was watching those episodes, but I was watching those episodes. First one I can remember watching is the second Doctor episode, The Invasion, where the Cybermen come up through the sewers in central London, which stopped me watching Doctor Who for a couple of years after that because I was terrified. And that was the classic thing of, I was watching it sat on the knee of my great-grandmother, right? And um, Nanny, she was called, and uh, I ended up uh, I ended up literally hiding behind the sofa. Uh, uh, and uh, it, and then didn't watch it for a couple of years and had one of my mates in the playground at the school going, oh, it's Doctor Who tonight. And I'm like, oh, don't watch that's too scary. Uh, and, and she was like, no, you really have to watch it. You would enjoy it. You know, and so and that was during the third Doctor era. But it's always interesting. So, so I was dismayed to hear when you were telling this that you all came on board in what I would, it was in an era of Doctor Who that came out when I was not only a fully grown human being, but I was like in my mid 40s. So, <laughs> so that was that in itself was enough time expansion for me personally for one for for one conversation. So you touched upon something in your process there, Enrica, that I was I opened the door to something else I wanted to get into, which is that often with San Diego panels, you know, we have people who are very interested in um, a career in in the comic book industry, and from each of your perspectives. What would you recommend if somebody was trying to break in? Because we, we have an artist, an author, and an editor. So I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. Um, in terms of writing, I would say, I always say start small, start writing short stories instead of trying to write, you know, a whole graphic novel or, a, you know, like 90 issue uh, masterpiece, because you really want to get a feel for how the format works and, really build your skills and being able to tell a story with a limited number of space, like like few panels, few pages. Um, you really need to learn to drill down into what's important in the story and what you actually need to show because you're really learning to tell a story in freeze frame as opposed to, you know, like writing a script for a movie or a TV show. Uh, so that's, it's a, it's a hard skill. Like I think coming from most other forms of writing, it really does sort of stand alone in how the story is constructed. So, you know, really focus on learning the format and do that by, you know, doing a very small story where you're very limited in the space you have to tell it. Yeah, I think those, those are very wise words. How about yourself, Enrica? Uh, for me, I would suggest, I think this is a valuable thing to do for both coloring and penciling or inking, uh, I suppose lettering as well. Uh, so first of all, you have to practice a lot and be very patient. Uh, it takes time. It's a skill like dancing, like martial arts, anything else. It's just lots and lots and lots of practice. Uh, if you have a chance when conventions are a thing again, but also online portfolio reviews are always a good thing. Uh, both by publishers, but also by uh, professionals. If there's anyone uh, that, uh, especially maybe there's someone that has, uh, that produces the type of comic that you would like to do, uh, or the type of content that you'd like to do, just 
have their opinion and be very uh, respectful and listen uh, to what editors and professionals have to say because they generally have more experience than you. And even if sometimes it can be a bit depressing and you're a bit tiring to hear, oh, you have to improve this part and you have to work hard, see you next year. You know, I know it's tough and we would all like to go back home with lots of new contacts and contracts and ideas and projects, but it's a, a long way. <laughs> so be, be open to feedback and just keep practicing and uh, find collaborators online and maybe writers, beginner writers or other people that you can make small projects with and maybe you can publish those small projects and having the experience of bringing a project from beginning to end and then bring that to editors and other people maybe get a table and sell your own productions that shows people and yourself that you can commit to a project and that's something that you're going to need in your career so yeah i think that's a good place to start i think that's a very important very practical advice which is, is very useful actually mate and uh, and jake i'd like you to answer this question in two ways because you're a guy, of course, who commissions um, writers and artists, although if anybody's watching this, we're OK with writers and artists for Doctor Who. This team are doing amazing. <laughs> so, yeah, we're, we're not looking for replacements. Yeah, so. we're, we're not looking for replacements for our Who books. But, but I, I, I'd be interested in knowing what you're looking for from creators, but also what your journey to being an editor actually was, because that's something I rarely hear people expand upon. Um, yeah, and it's a funny one with editing because, like, yeah, it's it's not as creative as, say, being the artist or the writer. You know, there is some creativity to, to it, but a lot of it is, you know, organisation and making things happen, bringing everything together. So obviously, when you're looking for writers and artists and stuff, you're not just looking at their talent and how good they are. You're looking at, you know, can they meet deadlines? Can they um, do a 22 page four issues? can they or can they do uh, do they work better over big scale graphic novels you know it's, it's things like that that you don't often think of when you're when you're just thinking oh, how good how good is this writer or how good is this artist um so yeah it depends what sort of projects you're looking at really um and in my own journey to becoming an editor it's, it's really strange because before actually becoming an editor I didn't really realize that comic books had editors <laughs> you know it's one of those things you think Oh, actually, it's, it's kind of obvious, but before that, it was like, oh, what, what does an editor do? So I've learned so much just being here and, you know, yeah. just learning on the job, doing what I do. And it's like, oh, wow, I've learned so much. And this is what an editor would do. Um, so I think it's just a case of like, particularly um, with the sort of stuff we do, you know, um, it's very much franchise based, but also comics in general. You know, it's, it's, it's something that you, you have to enjoy and, you know, you have to know about. And I think that's key to, for, to work in this kind of industry like it doesn't matter how good you are per se I mean you can always get better and work at your craft and what you're doing but I think a passion for comics is, is key in this yeah you, you know you have to be interested and enjoy it I think that's very well said and I think we've we've strayed into something I think that's a, a trifecta really uh interesting uh, feedback and advice and you've all kind of rung a particular bell which is it's very important for people to bear in mind, and it's what I think people outside of the comics industry often don't realise, is the huge importance of logistics and doing your work on time and hitting deadlines is because comics come out on a deadline that's unshakable. You can't not publish them. It's not like publishing your own novel where you're free to noodle around and play, you know, work on it for five years if you want before you submit it to anybody. Generally speaking, it's work for hire. You can be producing your own stuff, of course, but any kind of work for hire stuff, which is a huge percentage of the industry you've really got to be hitting your marks and reliability is just as important as creativity and very interesting hearing you guys talk about that and i think it's probably the big thing that fans who wish to become creators that's the big part of the journey they have to get their heads around and i i think it's probably the thing that's thought about the least from the outside if that makes sense yeah, I've 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 been told once by some friends, and who are also uh, in the industry that there is three qualities that are crucial to being a comic artist. You have to be nice, you have to be good, and you have to be fast. Yeah. To in a, in order to succeed, you have to have at least two of those. Yeah. 
you can't just be nice you can't just be quick you can't just be good you have to have at least two if you have three that's amazing but at least you have to be professional nice and quick or good and quick but you have to be like mindful of this being very good and never delivering on time is not it's not going to be enough <laughs> And, and honestly, like being nice and being someone who people actually want to work with because you're just not an awful jerk person, that's probably the easiest of the three. So there's kind of really no excuse for not having that one. Just be, a good, be a good collaborator, you know, don't, 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 if you're a writer, don't act like you're artists or like dancing monkeys or something to, you know, be a, you're working on a story together, you're telling a story together. Um, yeah, appreciate the people you work with. I think yeah, that's, I all, the, that's all, very well said. Have all three, just without a doubt. <laughs> right on. Yeah. I, and it, 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 it is, it's very well said because it's a collaborative medium, which means you have to collaborate, which means you have to have respect for your co-workers and colleagues and co-creators. And it's such an important thing. you know. It's And the reality is a lot of uh, creative endeavour that we aspire kind of a diva behavior to, or however you want to describe it. Actually, you are always talking about collaborative mediums. There's no, not really any such thing as a film by, a film is by like 350 people who work on it, right? And comics are the same, maybe with the scope of the numbers is slightly less. So I think everything you've just said is very important. Um, and when it comes to practicalities, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is, how has uh, working during the lockdown been the, for the three of you? How, what's your experience of that been like? Um, I'm, as I, I was technically a work from home before the lockdown for yeah. a few years now, but I always did my best to go other places and have like writing dates with friends or do the cliche coffee shop thing um, just to get out as much. So that part was difficult. Uh, the only places I've really been able to write over the past 15 months are either at home or my boyfriend's place because we were, you know, bubbling and uh that, that did make it harder, definitely, because uh, I've always found that having a change of scenery is really good and really useful. Um, but, you know, you do you do what you can and you find workarounds as much as you can. Yeah, for sure. How about yourself, Enrica? Uh, for me, it's not been too different because I normally, as, as Jody, I also work from home. I don't have like a, a studio out of my home where I normally live. Uh, but the thing I have is that I, I'm from Italy and I had plans to move to the UK in the following two or three years. And then basically last year I got stuck <laughs> when Italy went into full lockdown. So I stayed here for six months and I had to make it to be what I had. So I had my laptop and my tablet. So I kept working from here. Now I'm slowly building up my workstation to be a bit more uh, neck friendly because I'm <laughs> having some issues with that. But other than that, I don't like, I'm not someone who works like on an iPad outside. And lots of uh, colleagues and friends do that. For me, it's just, I like my my workstation and I think the thing that helped me a lot is just I, I try to be active as much as I can so I work out every day I try to be I, I try to eat healthy and you know if I can go in the garden for a breath of fresh air that helps uh, but luckily I would say I didn't suffer as as much uh, as uh, a lot of other people have uh, during this month I definitely miss seeing friends and I miss conventions and I hope that we can safely go back to that uh, soon but luckily it hasn't impacted my, my work as uh, terribly as it has for a lot of other people yeah hey, hey, how about yourself Jake um, yeah it's probably impacted me the most because I was normally office based so in a good old Titan house in London um, but luckily I'm not too far um, out of there I just live in South London so once we all started working from home um, it was fine like all, all our work we can do from home so it wasn't an impact really issue um, on that issue of doing the work and um, yeah it's just been sadly stuck at home and not going out uh, so and having having that laptop there all the time it's very very hard not to work yeah <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I hear you, brother. I think we're all very lucky working in a creative industry. So it's quite portable and everybody can work at home. Yeah. And we've all done the same thing, which is good. But and certainly and it's much more fortuitous than there are many, many people I know in 
other industries and other professions and it's been much tougher for them now because they have yeah. to be there in, in, in a working space and it's not been as easy and that's been difficult so i think we've been privileged lucky and whatever you want to call it in that respect but i think everybody misses the social oxygen which is a big part of creative endeavor and it's not just about when you're sitting down writing or scheduling or or painting it's 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 also about those conversations that fuel that creative endeavor that the the social lives that we all miss and and that's absolutely tough and i'm with you guys i really hope we get back to you know being able to meet in those collective uh festivals that are the the comic cons and that we're back on that scene because there's nothing better than interacting with the fans of the books that we produce that you guys create with the fans with the people who purchase them buy them with other professionals that's a, that's a really powerful thing i think yeah, absolutely. And arcing back into Doctor Who, where I'd like to close out on is, now that you've really knocked it out of the park with Doctor Who Missy, what else within the pantheon of Doctor Who would you guys like to get to play with next? I, mean, I, I definitely know. You go, you go Jody. I was going to say, I don't know how much I can say on stuff that is upcoming, but um, probably I don't think anything yet, really. But um, one character I'd love to do more with who uh, did pop up in Missy uh, a little bit was River Song. So I haven't really written much of River Song yet and she would be really fun to tackle because she's another one who is clearly off having crazy adventures without the doctor and it would be yeah. fun to see uh, some more of those. I know they've done some in Big Finish, but uh, I want to write some too. <laughs> Yeah, you, you guys would have a, you guys would create a great River Song series. Did you see actually that, um, Jake, that Alex Kingston was in the office recently? Yeah, she was the, a couple of weeks ago, wasn't it? Or the other yeah, week. Yeah. Done a, a Melody Malone book. So yeah. maybe that's something we can think about for, for Titan Comics. Yeah. I, mean, I think you guys collectively would do a great job. How about yourself, Enrica? I'm very happy that Jody mentioned River because it was the first thing that, that I thought of. And I was like, can I, can I say it? I think so. Can I say it? Can I say it? And then Jody said it, so I can say it. Uh, we did do some river and, and uh, we had her in a little bit in this arc, but uh, she's definitely, uh, River and Amy are my favorite companions yeah. in general. Uh, so uh, those two are two characters that I really enjoy and I think that they would work uh, really well on on a panel yeah. and yeah after doing Missy which I knew was the number probably number one <laughs> fave for, for Jody uh, I think that those would also be very 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 interesting and fun characters to work on and, and Jake I know that we're yeah. tied up with our our, uh, our commitments to the BBC and the BBC reveal information about Doctor Who in a very precise way so we have to be very careful but what we we can tell everybody watching is that this amazing team is going to be returning on some more great stuff, right, mate? Oh, yeah. I mean, look, look forward to many more Doctor Who stories to come. Um, like, we've just had Missy, um, so there'll be definitely other characters we'll look to, to see in the future, and um, plenty of other Doctors. Um, I would love to do 9th and 11th, because those are two that I haven't done out of the new ones so far. I've hit, we've hit 10th, 12th, and 13th in the last couple of years. I'd love to do 9th and 11th, so keep your eyes peeled. Brilliant. And, and I ask this question every time we do one of these things, but it's, it's always good to answer it again for a slightly different audience. You never know who's going to be watching. Um, Favourite Doctor, everyone? Still probably 10. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. I think 11, 11th for me, I think. Ah, interesting. Yeah. Enrique? I think for me, I'm, of course, I'm very... Uh, I really love 13 because she's like my doctor as in she's the one that brought me in uh, I think 12 is my number number one. Oh, brilliant I, I love the fact that you're all gone for a different one and I, my vote's different too I would go for ninth there we go so uh, I'm a huge Eccleston fan I think he's amazing and yeah, speaking of it, mate, what's that Jake sorry because he's northern yeah and he's northern as well yeah that's the most <laughs> important thing yeah no that that's absolutely the key I just wish he played the doctor for longer mate that's the thing yeah yeah. yeah, and I'm glad that he's back doing the big finish stuff because mm -hmm. uh, because you know he's definitely got more gas in the tank and he's such a great actor. I, I just have to say real quick, he was a guest uh, at Gallifrey One last year, which was the one convention I made it to, and I could not get up the courage to talk to him. Oh no, no mate! Oh, no. No. Well, he was eating lunch. I didn't want to bother yeah. him, you know. But oh, I was okay. like, mm, 
yeah so hopefully he'll be a guest again and i can actually like i'm, I'm sure so he, clearly, clearly he's Jake, we need to do ninth doctor uh story so i have a reason to talk to him <laughs> that, that is a plan and a half isn't it you know, you know we'll even if it's not a standalone ninth doctor but we've got to work him into the narrative so so we just got to make it happen we have to self-actualize right that's that, that <laughs> that's the key um so this has been san diego 2021 um, you have been watching the Titan Comics Doctor Who comics panel with the amazing Jodie Hauser, with the mighty Enrica Angelini, with the always organised Jake Devine, and this amazing uh, editorial and creative team with Roberta Ingranata um, ha- will be back with the collection of Doctor Who Missy, which will be out in October. You can find all four books in your local comic book shop right now. And we'll be back with some more great Doctor Who comics before the year is out also. So uh, keep keep checking out Forbidden Planet TV on YouTube as soon as we can announce. That's what we're going to do. And guys, thanks so much for joining us at Virtual San Diego this year. Thanks for having Thank us. You. Thank you. It's been amazing. Take care, everyone. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Yeah. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.